really glad that you are here. And um, I wanted to uh, just kind of continue with our series, Divine Intrusion. Glenn got us started last week, and um, we're going to continue to look at different aspects of the Christmas story uh, for the next few weeks and to see how God made his presence known uh, among the people then and how he still um, invades our lives today in ways that um, maybe are shocking, um, maybe are welcomed, but uh, ultimately are transforming. I can't help but think about the birth of Jesus and also kind of wonder what was going through Mary and Joseph's mind because... uh, because I am a dad, and it always causes me to think back when my kids were born. I don't know if anybody else thinks about that. Not my kids, but your kids, um, what that was like. But um, I was thinking about the timing of Jack and Callie's birth. Jack was born August 23rd, 2002. And on August 22nd, 2002, I was at a Cardinals baseball game. They were playing the Pirates. I was there with some friends from church. Uh, enjoyed the game. We came back on the bottom of the ninth, scored two runs, won five to four. I get home and I'm ready, you know, to, hey, Beth, guess what? We This great come from behind win. And she is, is in bed, holding her belly, moaning in serious pain. And, uh, and so they had told us, you know, when contractions get to within, and now I've forgotten, within like three minutes apart or something like that, you should go to the hospital. Does that sound about right? Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, well, we need to time these. And they were like 45 seconds apart. <laughs> and, and so we were, you know, kind of like, oh, my goodness, what do we do? Well, it was, it was August. It's the Midwest. Um, it was a hot, sweaty evening at Bush Stadium for that ball game. And so she's in a hurry to get to the hospital. And I'm thinking, I don't smell good. Um, I'm going to take a shower first. <laughs> she said the same thing. And... Uh, <laughs> Callie uh, made her grand entrance into the world on March 3rd, 2005. Um, On March 2nd, uh, a Wednesday night, I was speaking to a a group of of youth at a church in St. Louis. Beth was with uh, Jack, young Jack at the time, and several of her girlfriends and their kids at Chuck E. Cheese. One of Jack's buddies was having a birthday party. And, And so they're at Chuck E. Cheese, and she begins to have... Uh, contractions. She starts going into labor, and it was she knew it was time to start making her way to the hospital. Jack, though, thought it was time to make his way into those tubes that are suspended from the ceiling. And the more she and the other ladies were calling him to come back out of the tubes, the more he thought it was a fun game and climbed further into the tubes. And so Beth, very pregnant, climbs into the tubes and gets uh, Jack. Um, but the good news is that night. I was already showered. So um, a baby's arrival can come at an inconvenient time, yes? And a baby's arrival can really disrupt what's going on in a home, yes? (laughs) In fact, it just continues disrupting for the rest, yeah. Um, These are two primary points that I want to make today as we look at this Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. Jesus' birth marks a divine intrusion into our day today into uh, our concept of time and what we have planned. And Jesus' birth also marks a divine intrusion into our homes, into our lives. And so let's begin by looking at this passage in Luke 2. We'll read the first seven verses. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that, uh, that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. If you are, um, if you have jumped in with our Christmas reading plan, then you may have already read Galatians 4, 4, where Paul is talking about this time that has come when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. 
Um, this is a, just a, a, a picture for us that there is a, a divine moment where God is choosing to act. Um, there was a, a, more than Mary was pregnant. This moment was pregnant with what God was about to do. And we see this, um, how it was a divine intrusion in that day. It was not a coincidence. It was planned and it was timely. Um, let me kind of illustrate the, the difference between time and timely as best as I can here. Um, we have, for instance, uh, for a, a worship service that we put together, uh, we have an order of service. We have times kind of scheduled out uh, before the service. In addition to praying, we talk to each other and make sure that we have this specific order in mind. For this service, I knew there were going to be three songs. Uh, before I got up here, um, there were also going to be uh, a, a welcome time. We were going to show a video. Kids was, would be dismissed. We also talked about confetti, which is not something we typically talk about before the services. But there was a time to all of these things. And then when the offering is being given, um, after that is when I would, that would be my time to come up here on stage. But I have to, I have to tell you, I have no sense of rhythm or timing when it comes to music. Um, I don't know if you've ever kind of been singing with a group of people and there's supposed to be a little longer pause and you started too soon and you're the only boy, that's, that would be me, okay? Um, there have been times when I thought the song was over and I've started making my way up only to find out that there was like just, that was the bridge and they were still continuing on with the song. So then I try and look real casual as I'm going back to the pew and act like I knew what I was doing the whole time. No, so here's how, you want to know how I knew it was time for me to come up? I'm looking at Jake, and he gives me the nod. He just kind of goes, and I know that that's my time to start making my way up. Because Jake has a really good sense of timing. Jake understands the music. He understands the song that's going on. And so I wait for the nod, whether it's Jake or Scott, somebody that just has a feel for that moment I'm waiting for them to give me the nod. And that's really the difference between time and timing. And I want you to know, this is a point in time when God was giving the nod. There is something that's about to happen here. And it begins, we see this, this passage begins with, in those days, Caesar Augustus. Now, what this tells us is that there was someone ruling and in charge that was not a follower of God. This leader in the Roman world, the, the world was controlled by, by Roman rule at the time, and uh, Caesar was not um, a believer. Uh, he did not have a faith in God. He was not looking forward to a promised Messiah. If anything, uh, if he had really known what was going on, he would have seen that as did Herod as a, as a, a potential threat. And so I want us to, to understand that a divine intrusion can come even when those who don't know him are used to accomplish his purposes. You see, um, this story, by mentioning Caesar Augustus, what we see is that he didn't realize it at the time, but God gave him the nod and said, I want you to call people to a census here. And what he didn't know was God was saying, there is a prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. And I need Joseph and Mary to come to Bethlehem as has been prophesied. So Caesar Augustus, who did not have a relationship with God, is still being used by God, responding to this nod. And this is a reminder that because these are not just intrusions, these are divine intrusions into our day, um, we we can live without anxiety or worry because it's God that's behind these things. Because God is in control and his timing is perfect in every aspect of life. Um, what we fail to realize sometimes, I'm just preaching to myself right now, if anybody else wants to listen in on this, but what we fail to realize is that God is at work behind the scenes using people that we would have never have guessed to bring about his will for our life. And when we realize that these are not just intrusions, these are divine, godly, ordained intrusions into our day, we can breathe. We can experience a deep rest in the midst of this. 
And so we see that time might be measured in hours and minutes or something on a calendar, but there is something and when it comes to timing that just recognizes a moment and responds to the nod. Um, it's, it's, it's the word that a woman will use talking to the father of her baby saying, it's time. It's time. And that's exactly what we read in verse 6. While they were there, while Mary and Joseph were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Now this time, God gives the nod to Jesus in the womb. And it is time. And I believe at that moment, Mary reaches out and grabs Joseph by the collar and pulls him in close and with gritted teeth says, it's time. <laughs> it's in the Greek. Um, yeah. Verse 1 says, in those days, and verse 6 reads, and the time came. The word for days and the word for time is actually the same word in the Greek. It's interpreted just a little bit different to help with the flow of the reading. But what I want us to do in an application of this, I want us to consider the days that we are in. I want us to consider the circumstances of this season of our lives and then consider God's timing. So what are the days that you are living in right now? And how is God's timing going to maybe be a little bit different than what you logically anticipated? Because we kind of have in our minds what time is best for us to act, do we not? We'll use phrases like, um, when I get my kids through college, then I will. Um, once I get my own life together, then I um, once I get out of debt and get my finances together, um, once things slow down at work, after the holidays, then, and so we have kind of in our mind what is going to be a good time, but with a divine intrusion, sometimes God's timing is different than ours, isn't it? In fact, I've come to realize God does not wear a watch, okay? He, he knows what is the best moment and sometimes that runs countercultural to what we would consider. Um, Galatians 4.4, 4, I referenced this earlier, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. When the set time had fully come, God gave. God gave his son. So let me ask you, is it time for you to give? Is the timing in your life right to give? Logically, it may not make any sense at all. But is, is there a divine intrusion saying, right now, I want you to give of your life? And there's a lot of ways that we can give. Maybe you were moved by the video and this idea that, that we have of, of helping the homeless in our city and on the other side of this world. Maybe God is moving in you in that way. And maybe there's that thought of you thinking, well, once I get my kids through college or once I get my finances under control, but what if God right now is giving you the nod? Could that be? Um, maybe it's not even finances. Maybe this is your time to serve. And you're looking at your calendar and you're thinking, I have no, um, no margin whatsoever in my calendar. If I can just kind of get the rest of my world to slow down a little bit, but maybe God's given you the nod that you need to give some of your time on a Tuesday night with the youth or on a Sunday morning in our children's ministry. Or there's just an organization that you're passionate about, and he's saying, now. Now is the time for you to move and to give and to serve. Maybe now is the time for you to use your vacation time to go on a mission trip. Maybe now is the time for you to use your gifts and your skills and your talents for a God-glorifying cause. Maybe now is the time for you to be baptized and to give your life to Jesus. And in response to that, one of the ways that, that people kind of have their own time frame in mind, and I've heard this several times, someone will say, well, I'll give my life to Jesus and I'll get baptized, but first, I kind of want to get my life together. I kind of want to clean up my life, which is kind of like saying, I'm going to get really healthy and then I'm going to join a gym, Okay. The reason you join a gym is to get this process going. The reason we give our out-of-shape lives to Jesus is so that he can begin making us whole again. So 
What would it look like? What if right now is the time God is giving you the nod to give your life to him, to join a life group, to pair up with someone in accountability? In any of those areas, is God giving you the nod? And I want to remind you of what I was mentioning earlier. God is already at work planning and preparing for this moment where he's giving you the nod. This isn't as sudden as you might think. God's been preparing for you to give in whatever way he's calling you to give in this moment. Now, uh, so we see that there can be a divine intrusion into our calendar, into our day, into the way we're living our lives. And there's also a divine intrusion in our home life. Luke 2, 7 says that Mary wrapped Jesus in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. If you have a nativity set, it probably has a picture of, of Mary and Joseph in some type of a barn. Um, there's a lot of different um, perspectives, different scholars um, don't all agree on what this looks like, but some recognized scholars um, have reminded us of what the typical home looks like in the culture of that day. For one, uh, Joseph returning to Bethlehem and being himself in the Davidic line would have probably been welcomed in Bethlehem. He probably would have been known in that town just by saying, you know, hey, here's my ID. I'm, I'm of David's line. That right there would have probably opened up some doors to him. But it was a very crowded time because of the census. And most homes in that day were divided up basically into two rooms, um, very small places with two rooms. And in one room, the primary room, is where they did all of their meals. It's where they lived. It's where they slept, everything right there. And then this other smaller room, sometimes it would be um, hollowed out and, and a little bit lower in the ground, is where they would bring their animals in at night. And they would bring their animals in at night for a couple of reasons. One, uh, so that they wouldn't um, be stolen, so thieves would not take away their animals in the middle of the night. And then also in winter months, they would also provide warmth. And so just so you know, just the, this really tiny two-room house rents for about $4,000 here in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and so this is, the, this is the picture that we have here, this living space and then these small guest quarters. And there would oftentimes be sometimes a manger hollowed out in the rock or the ground from uh, this, this feeding trough where the animals would feed at night when they came in. And so likely this is the setting for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. So just as a very simple point of application, um, have you welcomed Jesus into your home? And if so, where is he? Is he centrally located and a part of everything that takes place in your home, or is he relegated to guest status and set off to the side? Maybe another way to ask this question is, what would you do if Jesus were coming over to your house? What would you do? Um, many, many moons ago, BB, before Beth, um, I, was, I, was, I was dating this girl, actually before Beth, I dated a lot of girls. <sighs> yes, I finally got married. It was not for a lack of trying. And um, uh, so I was at, I was at seminary, and in Fort Worth, and I met this girl, and, and uh, my home at the time was St. Louis, but had, you know, was going to school down there. She was from Canada, and Christmas rolled around that semester, and I wished she could have followed me, come with me to meet my family in St. Louis. It was getting pretty serious. We had seen each other almost a full week, and uh, <laughs> so... Uh, but it didn't work out for her to come to, to my house in St. Louis. And so I get this idea when I'm there in St. Louis, you know, she couldn't be here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to video our house and my family, and she can watch this video, and it would be kind of like she's here. Now, this is in the days before the Facebook Live, um, before Facebook, before any of these things. This is when we had a video camera that had a big VHS cassette in it, you know? All right, kids, we'll tell you about that later, all right? And, uh, and so I get this idea, and my brother is home from college, and he's going to help me out with, with my plan. 
And so he is the cameraman, and we begin on the front porch of my parents' house. And I say, hey, I, I know you couldn't be here, but I just thought I would give you a tour of the house. Maybe it's best that you're not here because then you can kind of see us how we really are, you know, so you don't think that we're, you know, trying to do something special just because you're here and putting, putting our best foot forward. And so uh, my brother's going to co- cut off the camera, and when we turn it back on, we'll be in my living room. So my brother cuts off the camera, we jump in the car, and we go down to this department store that has really nice furniture. <laughs> and the furniture is set up, you know, by rooms, you know. And so, so I'm on like a $5,000 sofa in this department store. My brother turns the camera on. And, of course, giant price tags on everything, the lamps and the coffee tables and everything. And I say, hey, welcome into our living room. It's pretty, this big, sprawling room, as you can tell. A lot of furniture. And, of course, there's people, like, walking in and out of that. And they go, oh, we got cousins over. Uh, a, lot, a lot going on at the house right now. And, uh, and so, the, obviously, uh, you know, just, hey, I wish you could hear, be here because uh, we've got a really nice place. Well, obviously, the whole thing was, you know, meant to be funny. I thought it was hilarious. I was about the only one that thought it was hilarious as we watched the video later. But here's, here's the point I want to make. Um, can we admit that we would like to have Jesus over, but we kind of want to show him that, that best part of us? And maybe it's just the part of us that we wish was and not the part that is. When we invite Jesus into our life, are we trying to move around the furniture, kind of pick some things that we really want up front for Jesus to see, like we can convince him with this good stuff that, oh, maybe, maybe that's a home that I want to be in someday. See, this series is not called human manipulation. It's called divine intrusion. There's nothing we can do to convince God that our, that our lives are good enough that they have finally earned the privilege of inviting Jesus in. Um, But because of his divine work and because of his grace, um, he says, I will enter into the mess of your life. And that's really the intrusive part, isn't it? When someone comes over to our house and they see the messy parts, Jesus says, "I, I see all of your life, and I'm okay with that. Um, cut the video camera off. <laughs> Just let me be here with you. Um, it turns out that God doesn't find it very funny when we're trying to, to pose and to hide and to show him some of the good stuff too. And so I want us to kind of, we've thought about what it's like to allow Jesus in to our day. Um, we're considering um, how it can be a little bit uncomfortable to let Jesus into our lives and the way he can divinely intrude into some of the messiest um, areas of our life. But now I want us to think about what would it be like for us to bring Jesus back out into the world? What if God wanted to use us for a divine intrusion to usher Jesus, to birth Jesus into the world around us? And I want to begin by making a, a, just this, I want you to picture yourself in Mary's shoes. I want you to picture your very pregnant, swollen feet in Mary's shoes. As we consider what it's like to be a part of this miraculous bringing forth of Jesus. Because this is the thing that we sometimes forget in this time of year. Yes, it was divine. The birth was miraculous, but it was also painful. Can I get an amen, ladies? <laughs> we forget that in the midst of this heavenly work, that it was done in a very earthly way. Jesus entered this world by way of a miracle, but also by way of great discomfort and pain, especially to Mary. So what I want us to consider are the ways that we could be like Mary, the ways that we can usher Jesus into the world around us, bringing Jesus to those who need him. But I want to say up front, it could be beautifully miraculous, but it also could be uncomfortable and painful for us to do this. Are we willing to allow ourselves to bear Jesus to this world? 
Um, here at Central, we have bet the house on the fact that Jesus said, go and make disciples. We are really taking this serious, what Jesus said. Um, when he tells us to go and make disciples, um, we, we take this seriously, and this is our way of saying um, we want to carry Jesus back out into the world and introduce him to others. So when you recognize and respond on God's call on your life to make disciples, you will be a part of something that is heavenly and miraculous, but may also bring some pain and discomfort. As you make disciples, I want you to be also, as you consider this pain, I think you'll also be like a new mother who says, oh, it was worth it. It was worth it. Another one of our readings for this week uh, is in Psalm 40, and it emphasizes this particular call that each of us has to bring Jesus into the world. Listen to what it says in verses 9 and 10. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. You bring Jesus out into the world through the stories that you tell. You bring Jesus out into the world when you live an upright and righteous life. You bring Jesus out into the world when you talk about God's faithfulness in your own life. You bring Jesus out into the world when you live a life of love and faithfulness for others. So what is the unique way that God is calling you to be a Mary? What is the unique way that God is calling you to usher Jesus into the world around you? Who would be blessed by the unique story of your life, of the divine intrusion that you have allowed Jesus to make in your life? Is there a unique way that you can serve? Is there a unique way that you can speak to someone that has a specific need or a unique way that you can listen in love to someone who is in need. A couple of weeks ago, a couple of Tuesday nights ago in our life group, that was a part of our discussion. One of the discussion questions had to do with um, what, is, what has God gifted you to do? And um, what's, it, what's it like when you position yourself to be a conduit of God into this world? And one by one, people in my Tuesday life group began to share the unique ways that they love to serve. And as they were sharing some of these stories, and some of them sharing with tears, there was just a joy in that room as we talked about how excited we get when God chooses to use us in a way, and, and no one's way in that circle, no one mentioned two ways the same. And we've got actually one couple in my life group that's not here right now because they had an opportunity to go and to serve and use their gifts somewhere else this morning. That's where they are, and that was our text back and forth, way to go. You're bringing Jesus out into the world using the gifts that he has given you. And they are so excited about that. So how do you know when and where to begin? If you've got this, this gift, this calling to bring Jesus out into the world, how do you know when to start doing that? Well, I believe he's given you the nod. He's saying, now, I want you to look for the ways that that you can bear Jesus, bring Jesus out into the world. I want to invite um, the band up. We're going to prepare for communion, and also um, those of you that are going to be serving as communion, our, our youth today, you can make your way out there and grab those trays for us. Um, that video that I made for my girlfriend, I want to kind of reach back to that. Not only did we go to a department store, uh, but there were other aspects of the video that I thought were going to be kind of funny. And uh, there was one segment that uh, we videoed that showed my family and I around the table, around the dinner table. Now, to, to set that up, I have to tell you about my first date with her. My first date with her, I take her to a restaurant. I don't remember what the restaurant was. I don't really remember much of anything about the date other than we ordered our food. The food gets brought in front of us. Uh, we said a, a prayer of grace over the meal, and I began digging in. And when I say digging in, this is kind of how I held my fork, and this is how it went. And this was, um, this was how I used to hold my fork. And I didn't think anything about it until that date. 
because in the middle of this meal, I'm eating, and I just, I notice just kind of that she's not moving, she's not eating, and I look up, and she's just kind of staring at me. Her mouth is kind of open a little bit, and she goes, who taught you how to hold a fork? No, who didn't teach you how to hold a fork? And I'm just kind of looking at her like, it works, you know? And I, I knew what she was talking about. I knew, you know, it should more appropriately be held like this. So the, the position of the fork, fork in my hand was kind of a little disturbing to her. Well, so we go to video my family at this meal. Everybody is holding <laughs> forks like this, drinking like this, belching. It was just really rough. And, I, and my only commentary was, oh, these are the people who forgot to teach me how to hold a fork. <laughs> Again, I found that to be far funnier than she did. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives us specific instructions when we sit down at the table for a very special meal. He says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. In other words, Paul is sort of saying, it's, it's not the position of the fork in your hand, it's the posture of your heart that matters. Paul is addressing these Corinthian Christians and basically he's saying, who taught you how to take, who forgot to teach you how to partake in this special meal? Because there's a way that we prepare our hearts to receive the bread and the cup. And so that's what I want to invite you to do. Because when, when Jesus invades your home, when there is a divine intrusion into your life, he desires to forever alter the posture of your heart, the bent of your desires and your will. So I'm going to invite you uh, just to bow your heads and to begin now to examine the posture of your heart. I want you to take just a few moments and even as the trays are passed here in just a second, to allow God to transform the posture of your heart. In other words, maybe there is a messy part of your house that you need to allow Jesus to enter into. Allow him to intrude in that part of your house that you've maybe tried to shield with all the nice furniture. And let him come in and clean things up and to rearrange some things. Let him love you in that way. And as these uh, trays are about to be passed, um, the bread and the cup represent the sacrifice that Jesus offered for you and those of you that will partake are those of you who have received this sacrifice, who have accepted and allowed Jesus to divinely intrude into your life as the Savior. And if you're still struggling with allowing Jesus in, to mess with your mess, then I would encourage you just to, you can let the, the trays pass you by and just continue to wrestle with that. And maybe, maybe a conversation with one of us afterwards. Just to, uh, maybe you just say something like, how, how can someone love me even with this kind of mess in my life? And we would love to tell you about this beautiful Christmas salvation story. So let me pray for you and then we will uh, partake of communion. Father, um, Thank you, for, thank you for loving us. Thank you for wanting a second date with us, even when the posture of our heart is very crude. I thank you that um, you choose to love us, not because we finally cleaned up our lives, but you chose to love us in the midst of the mess, offering to clean us up and to make us more like you. And we thank you for this ongoing process of sanctification. Father, may this meal be a reminder to us of the ways that you desire to continually enter into our lives, transforming us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.